And welcome back. Our next guest recently proposed a bill preventing rideshare companies from charging higher prices during federal, state, and city-declared emergencies. Now, the proposal comes after the recent subway attack in Brooklyn on April the 19th. Joining me now to share more is the New York State Assemblymember of District 85, uh, Kenny Burgos. And uh, Assemblyman Burgos is glad to have you here and uh, our first time really doing this, but uh, hopefully won't be the last. And thanks so much for sharing with us. For sure. Thanks for having me, Darren. I hope it won't be the last either. Yeah, let's talk about this here. As we said, you know, you put this proposal out uh, after the subway attack on April 19th. Walk us through uh, your your reasoning for this legislation. For sure. I mean, I think we all saw what happened that morning in New York City, and it was a horrific event, um, to say the least. But, you know, one little piece that really stuck out to me was people were on Twitter and Instagram really complaining about not being able to leave the scene, whether you were directly impacted or not. Obviously, public, public transit was heavily affected. And, you know, we had Ubers and Lyft that were charging, you know, sky high rates. And now I've spoken to Uber and Lyft and I know, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't in a predatory way, but we want to avoid this ever happening. And I know they've done the right thing by refunding this money, but I think we should find a way legislatively just to avoid this ever occurring uh, if it unfortunately happens again. What was the response that you got from them? I mean, obviously they said they didn't do it in a predatory way, but they did do something because they actually raised the prices for people who are in the middle of a drastic emergency. Yeah. So their argument was that this is all algorithm based. So obviously they're not uh, privy to an emergency going on. The algorithm will just see a high demand and then they will then just raise the prices. So we're trying to find a way to get the language right to make sure that again, we can differentiate what is an emergency and then what is just a normal business model. Yeah. Did you hear a lot from the, the constituents in your area about this? Uh, were you, a lot of your constituents affected? I wouldn't say a lot. I mean, this is obviously in Brooklyn, but, you know, I mean, it's regardless, I represent the state, I represent a portion of the Bronx in the state of New York. And so I have a duty to make this as a whole or protect it um, from scenarios like this. And if we have a way to create policy, to pass a law that prevents, you know, activities like this from happening again, then we have a responsibility to do so. Yeah. Let's talk about the 85th for a minute. That's your district. And uh, obviously, as you said, you don't represent Brooklyn. You do represent the Bronx and uh, the proud assembly member of the 85th uh, Assembly District. Talk to us about uh, what do you see happening in your district and the things that you're acting on right now? Yeah, so my district covers uh, Soundview, Hunts Point, uh, Longwood, and also Rikers Island. Um, you know, but the issues that we face here in my district are the same issues we face in the Bronx and New York City. Uh, you know, people are struggling with rents. People are looking at a lot of uh, wage inequalities. People are uh, want to make sure we have better access to public transit. I mean, you name it. So there's a lot of stuff for us to, us to handle here in the state. We just passed a New York State budget that I think helps a lot with families and individuals here in New York. Uh, but the work really never stops. Yeah. And we talked about Rikers Island. That's being a part of your district as well. Uh, we know that the close for Rikers Island has been called. Uh, what can you bring us up to speed as far as Rikers Island is concerned? Well, the plan is to close it by 2027. It's still uh, the plan in action. Uh, the mayor has committed to closing the the uh, barge, which is situated on the water. Uh, so we're still talking with the administration to make sure that happens. Um, but you have now the feds that have even come down and say that we need a better plan. I mean, Rikers Island has really become a failed, failed operation. You have people dying, literally dying, that have not been convicted of crimes. You have individuals just facing just horrible conditions. And I mean, individuals both incarcerated and the correction officers and the nurses. I mean, you have to understand there's a lot of people that operate on this island and it has proven to just not operate correctly. So I think the city has to come out with a plan soon and propose to the feds. If not, you know, the feds have mentioned a possible takeover. Yeah. Uh, there's talk of what's happening in Rikers Island, and part of that is the reinstated TAP funding for uh, incarcerated individuals. For somebody who may not be so familiar, uh, explain to our viewers a little bit about what this means. Yeah. So Prior to 1995, incarcerated individuals always had an opportunity to apply for TAP, which is Tuition Assistance Program. Um, many people may be familiar if you've been to SUNY or CUNY or attended a university in New York. Um, but then post-95, when we had the war on drugs, when we had you know, the tough on crime era policy uh, under Pataki, it was removed. So for the past 25 years or so, you've had incarcerated individuals unable to access this funding to go to college. You know, we want people to rehabilitate themselves, want them to do better, come back to society, a, a, a much more well-rounded and, you know, uh, a better individual, but we have not given them the resource to do so. So I'm really proud of this budget this year that we've reinstated that amount. So now people who are incarcerated can actually take that time to rehabilitate themselves, 
come back into society, hopefully even with a college degree, get into the workforce, raise a family. And I mean, that's exactly what we want to see. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about legislation, you've been pretty busy yourself. And um, I think there's some people who are really, you know, want to shake your hand and really get an opportunity to talk to you about this one here, because you put in a bill talking about reducing the actual work week. Uh, so walk us through a little bit about what that entails and what would happen for New Yorkers if passed. Yeah, I mean, we, we can go on the on this bill, but, um, you know, I talk to folks and I think it's very apparent that work and the way we structure work is changing and has probably permanently changed um, due to the pandemic. You have a lot of companies that have switched to hybrid models. You have companies that have switched to entirely work from home models. I think Airbnb has just announced that they're going to allow any of their employees to work from anywhere in the globe. No change of pay. And they've still proven that they can be effective and productive. You know, the 40 hour work week was modeled during the Ford, during uh, the Ford assembly line, you know, kind of brought about the 40 hour work week. Since then, we have tremendously improved productivity. We have tremendously improved efficiency. We have proven that we can work from anywhere, pretty much in the globe. Uh, so with that in mind, I think it's time we start talking about a much better work-life balance. Americans have just been so, so focused on work and burnt each other out and efficiency. And, and we can still have this efficiency and productivity, I think. Uh, so my bill, it would do, it would change the 40 hour, the 40 hour overtime law and push it down to a 32 hour threshold, uh, which would essentially hopefully bring about the four day work week, which I think will be an effective and productive model for years to come. Uh, talk about your critics, because I know they're out there and they're saying that this is not a good idea, given the fact that we've got a, a hard time finding people to work right now. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would always push back and say we don't have a hard time finding people to work. I think part of that is people have questioned, you know, what about what do I want to do for work? How do I want to balance my life with work? Right. Uh, is the pay enough? Um, and I think there's a real reckoning. There's a real happening right now. And this is the moment where we can talk about that work week shift. Right. There was a lot of critics back when the 40 hour work week came in. I mean, prior to that, people were working six, seven days a week. That was standard. 10, 12 hours a day. That was a standard work week. Uh, and, and it seemed insane to have people only work eight hours a day, five days a week back then. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have to talk to the critics, but I think we'll, I think we, uh, I think history will look, will look proudly upon us for years to come. Yeah. As we enter into the summer, obviously we are preparing ourselves to really navigate. Uh, we're seeing numbers continuing to rise uh, with regards to COVID infections in New York City. Uh, what are we seeing in your district by way of infection, by way of being able to recover? Well, um, I mean, the same as New York City. New York City, unfortunately, has just moved into, I believe, what's called the yellow zone. Um, you know, saying that we just have a lot more cases coming about. So we're stressing people to just, you know, the same protections and safety measures that we have learned over the last two years. Please implement those. Obviously, if you haven't been vaccinated or boosted, we're encouraging folks to get that done. Uh, but thankfully, you know, I mean, I believe the science has shown that COVID has uh, decreased in terms of severity. Um, the dangerousness, you know, to, to death and serious illness, which is a great, great sign. I'm hopeful that we move into a space where COVID, you know, really does become just similar to a seasonal flu. I mean, we, we, know, we, we know we can't eradicate it completely at this point, um, but New Yorkers just have to stay vigilant, you know, just use the measures that we have learned and, and, and live your life as safely as possible, but still getting done what you have to get done. Yeah. And for yourself, um, you know, I think a lot of people have talked about during the, 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 the pandemic as an elected official that a lot of our areas really struggled with sometimes with access to resources and information and things that proceeded to get better uh, after a while. Talk to us about that right now. Are, do you feel comfortable with the access to resources, uh, vaccination opportunities, uh, you know, supplies that are necessary? Are you, are you comfortable with what you're seeing in your area? I think New York has led the charge in terms of vaccination resources and accessibility, and it's no different from my district. Uh, I think there's a fair amount of access. You know, there's certainly no lines at this point. Uh, I, I would love to see maybe a, a bit more, you know, increased testing um, and access to PPE. I mean, we do know that PPE is sometimes prohibitively expensive. I've seen people still to this day that, you know, reuse masks over and over, which is kind of counterintuitive to, you know, the hygiene protocol. Um, so maybe we can, we can always do better in that space. Uh, but it's a conversation to have with our city, our state, and even federal partners because we're not out the weeds yet. So we still have to provide those resources.
Yeah. Let me take a little uh, ride up the, inter uh, uh, up the interstate to Deegan, if you will, go into Albany and talk a little bit about the work that's going on there. Uh, you yourself uh, came out and said when it comes to the 421A tax break uh, that you are kind of like glad that it's not going to be included uh, in the delayed state budget as it's still being uh, talked about uh, in Albany. Uh, so for first, our viewers who may not be familiar with 421A, let's give them a little history as the 421A and what your position is right now. All right, I'll try to keep this concise. So 421A is a almost 50 year tax credit that's been on the books in the state of New York in one version or another. Uh, and this has been kind of on the books to help incentivize development. Back when the city and the state were in a real financial uh, predicament, if you will. Um, but now we've looked at it, we've looked at the data and 421A has just been a tax giveaway to developers. And the new proposal that came to the state uh, just a few weeks ago, I was completely against because one, it's a giveaway. And two, it did nothing to protect the people who live in my district now in the Bronx and protect people just to have actual affordable housing. It would have been basically a giveaway to developers to, you know, no tax, uh, no property tax for 35 years on your property. And you only give us 25% permanent afford affordable housing, quote unquote, leaving 75% of all units developed would have been at market rate. Uh, and we know when you talk market rate, in new developments, in emerging neighborhoods, especially the neighborhoods in the Bronx, it's not meant for the neighbors that are there. So I was completely against it. I'm thankful we didn't pass it in the budget. Uh, and now the discussions continue while we're in session until June. Yeah. Um, and as we talk about affordable housing, I want to talk because we see housing that's being developed. And I think that's what a lot of New Yorkers are saying, and particularly those in the borough of the Bronx and probably in your district as well. We're seeing housing development, but it, it being developed, but it doesn't look like it includes us. It looks like it's something around us, but we're not included in the process. Um, yeah. we're, we're, what, what kind of conversations are residents having with you when it comes to affordable housing and them being unhappy uh, about the development? Yeah, well, well, that's exactly that. You know, I think you have people across the gambit. The reality is we need more housing, right? The reality is in New York City, the demand is so high and the supply is so small that we have people doubling up, tripling up, you know, having a roommate or two has just become a standard thing. That was not a standard thing just a decade or two ago. And it shouldn't be the standard. You know, if you're uh, either a single adult or a couple just making a decent living here in New York, you should be able to afford a house, purchase a house, rent a house on your own. But it's just not the case right now. So as policymakers, we have to be deliberate in making sure that we're incentivizing housing being built but we have to make sure that, that housing is going to be for neighbors that have lived in these neighborhoods, right? People think sometimes when new housing is built, they automatically brand it as gentrification, uh, which is certainly the case in some ways, right? But if you do it the right way, if you do it with a surgical knife, it won't be gentrification, it's integration, right? It's, it's an increase of housing, but you're still making sure that people who have built those neighborhoods, who have lived there, raised their kids, can still afford to live there. And that's just the way we have to approach it. So I'm hopeful we can do it this way. I'm hopeful we, you know, we, we can produce housing in New York City and New York State going forward, but do it in a very precise and surgical way that it promotes integration and not gentrification. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I just want to have an opportunity to ask you a little bit about what people can look forward to as we are approaching summer in your district. Give people an opportunity to know if they're in the 85th, what they can uh, look forward to. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, once once I'm back home out of Albany, I'm always in the district on the streets. You know, we do our back to school giveaway. We're talking about maybe doing some concerts this summer. Uh, I might even host some some workouts, some events in Soundview Park, my favorite park in the city of New York. Uh, but, you know, just follow my Instagram, my Twitter, Facebook. Everything is at Kenny Burgos NY. Um, and you can see, you know, what we're doing. We'll, we'll be posting flyers uh, and stay tuned. All right. Well, we want to thank you so much for joining us, uh, Assemblyman Burgos, Assemblyman of the 85th Assembly District, joining us here on the Social Justice Forums. Thanks for being with us and uh, sharing and giving us some insight. Thanks so much, Darren.